that time of week once more for Muji and Dan to give you the comic store. It's time to open up those bags and boards, fans. Welcome to Get Your Pull. Get your pulls. Number seventy-seven. The first official twenty fourteen yeah. edition. Moving on. Woo! Trying to twenty fourteen year a, year of something. Hopefully, the year of a, a bigger and better year for potty humor and yeah. the potty humor network. You're the mooch. Maybe I don't know. I've called it five years in a row. Been wrong. <laughs> I got to be right eventually. I I think it could finally be. The year of the moods here. Yeah, got any you got any resolutions? Uh, I'm working on a couple. Yeah, not like I, I I hate New Year's resolutions because just that word in context implies that something you're gonna fucking give up on. But, yeah. Um, you know, I I do prefer the goal term as cheesy and lame as that fucking sounds. As much as it's just a synonym, but yes, keep going. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just like I look at it differently, you know. It's like, okay, I just sit down for the year and be like, okay, in a year it'd be cool if I accomplished these things. And I do that every year. Resolution has the stigma of your mom's friends not losing weight. So exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you don't so, want that to stay the same. Um, I, as of midnight tonight, will be a week into quitting smoking cigarettes. And, nice. Um, you know, mainly for, like, Cost reasons. Ties into the comics. Calculate that. Yeah, it's like, dude, I'm can... spending so much money on this habit that's yeah. like hurting me pretty badly. So you know, and I, I still enjoy smoking, and and you know, it's true. It is literally killing yourself by choice. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, maybe it's, it's enjoyable to me, but it's like risk reward. And now I'm 34, almost. I'll you know going into the 34 in 2014, late in the year. Still 33, yeah. not trying to put myself into an early grave. But yeah, I was gonna say, if you're 34, I'm 32. That don't work. It's 30, but son. It, in 2014, I will become 34. So you know, it's it's kind of time. Like I, I think I've won the battle thus far, and I'll just cut losses, and you know, may have a cigarette with a beer every now and again at a bar, but not buying a pack a day ever again. Hopefully, if I if this continues if this goal is truly met yeah so that's, that's good one. that's one that's that's been accomplished that's um, nice. I'm trying to think of, of oh one of my others was to um to get some shit rearranged in the house and uh, uh due to some <laughs> it, was a, it was a small resolution yeah it was but it, it, was, it, it was literally quickly, days of work but yes yeah, so it, it was done it was a goal you know yeah. and, and it was achieved that um i got some some rearranging done in my house and uh, sleeping arrangements are much more comfortable for me and my lovely spouse. So um, that's that's so far, and, and there's more. You know, mainly do more with PottyHumor.com. Still take a few yeah. bookings. Um, keep my wrestling presence out there, but you know, I'm really only doing things that are worth my time. And then, of course, yeah. read a shitload of comics. Yeah, it's true. I have a short couple. Decided for reading purposes, I'm gonna try to read. I don't make anything nuts, but I'm going to try to read a book like every two weeks. So, 26 for the year. That's that's the plan. And then, on top of that, just try to lose some weight. I have no thing planned, but um, start fucking day job, hopefully, by the end of the month. And then, go to the fucking gym, just to be less fat. Mostly just, you know, to live longer. <laughs> like, I don't care that much about getting super skinny, but just, you know, it's just not good to not exercise for a while. And then a lot of things just to fucking, out of the billion things that I've either written on my own or me and you have collaborated on, just to fucking finish one of them by the time the year's over. Just one. Yeah, like that's one, on my list, too, just to, get, to finish yeah, a writing project. Just, yeah, I have just, so many. Just get, like, that's my plan. Just get one Kickstarter finished by the end of the year. And I've kind of set, like, dates on, like, whatever is, like, before... What well, technically, I guess the beginning of February is probably when day job will start again. Is just get fucking one of them just finished written by then. I'm gonna see what happens with it. I just have it. Just so when fucking people ask me about writing, I'm not just like, I wrote like 90% of it and for some reason I couldn't finish it. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> Charlie Sold is writing seven books a fucking month. Oh, yeah, it's, I mean, that's the problem. Is that he's sucking all the fucking creativity out of the... There's only so many books that the universe will be allowed to be written at a time, and Bendis and Soul are fucking creeping in on everybody else's fucking patch. Like, they're pulling too many of the ideas out of the ether and fucking us over. So that could actually be a new resolution... It's to go Tanya Harding style and kneecap Ben Desensel, and then maybe we'll get all of our projects finished. <laughs> Just give some of the creativity back to the universe, motherfuckers. Break both of their hands. God, how do you do it? How do you write every book? I don't understand. I mean, more probably power to probably them, once you get fuck. that Probably once you get that first one written, it's just, I'm guessing, the fucking, you're good. Like, once you're like, get the first thing, you know? It's probably one of those, the baptism by fire, like if you got like a job writing comics at a place, probably extremely stressful the first time, like holy shit, like I have to write this like within the month, but then once you got one done, it probably becomes easier like every single week. But anywho, hopefully we'll get some of that stuff accomplished, especially the writing part. I actually trade, I'll get fatter if I can just finish some things, some things being written. Yeah, I got no health goals. I, I was <laughs> like, no. Yeah. No, I, I can't manage to. The, the smoking thing is the only health goal. Like, yeah. Yeah, I meet that, then maybe we'll talk about some physical activity next year. <laughs> no, let's not <laughs> rush things, okay? Yeah, exactly. But uh, I got a little bit of news, a lot of news going on. Marvel actually just today announced that they have a new big event coming for 2014, summer 2014, written by Jason Aaron, the art by Mike. Uh, Diodata? Yes. Hey, that's him? I don't know. Never Mike heard of him. Mike Donato, yeah. yeah. Um, he's uh, collaborated on the, the New Avengers projects with Brian Michael Bendis. That's what cool. he's most famous for recently, I believe. Yeah, a new project's going to be called Original Sin, and because it's comics and it's happening six months from now, they want to go ahead and let you know it's going to be about Death of the Watcher. So... I have to not spoil what the thing's going to be about. Apparently, we're going to find out tomorrow in the Marvel Point one that comes out that they preview it, and it just tells you in it, yeah, the Watcher is going to die this summer, and we're going to have an event about it. So that's been their normal thing. Either free comic book day or when they do a Point one thing like this, they they go and tell you. Like a year from now, it's some shit's going to happen. It's interesting because I love Jason Aaron. and He's great. Pretty much other than Wolverine, or not Wolverine, but uh, Avengers vs. X-Men, his track record has been pretty well spotless. And that wasn't his fault. He was one of 12 guys collaborating yeah. on one story. Um, but I'm hesitant to buy an event about The Watcher because it sounds like it's an, another Avengers story, and that's fine. The Watcher is a very important figure in the Marvel Universe. Uh, he is the sort of cosmic entity that shows up when major reality-altering events are about to occur. He just can't intervene. He can advise. Yeah. He can... Which makes you think he could be popping up in the movies before too long, which would make sense while they would pop him out in the comic before then. Sure, sure. And I, I think that's that's probably a good possibility. And I, I gotta wonder, though, who owns him. Because I think he was a Fantastic Four character at first. And if so... Would that make him property of 20th Century Fox, or would that Maybe. still make him part of Marvel? Those things are always so crazy, like, because, I mean, you know, obviously there's some characters that they both have access to, as will be seen in Avengers 2 and this new X-Men movie where, you know, so who knows? But that would seem like a weird fight to have over the Watcher, but <laughs> you never know. So I got announced just today, um, another bit of news which has been bumming out people that have been liking the Star Wars comics is, as everybody thought, Marvel putting the kibosh on the uh, the Dark Horse Star Wars comics. Even until the end of the year, though, they're taking them back starting in 2015. So they've at least, like a lot of people thought they would just immediately end, but... They're, Give them time to finish things up. Yeah, finish out their stories and stuff, but... Say their goodbyes. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, I, I think everybody saw that coming. I, I think that... Um, probably just got a potential to make a lot more money that way and that's the name of the game yeah i mean a i mean marvel even if they're just however many they're selling to the comics like they want that extra revenue b you never know i mean there's been i don't think this is going to happen but there have been rumors of somehow possibly integrating 
the Star Wars universe into the Marvel universe. I think that's a horrible idea to me. Fucking, that, that is, is a fucking goddamn terrible idea. That rumor has been terrible. That idea. rumor has been floated out. Just why don't we just fucking combine it all? Why don't we put fucking the Little Mermaid and Mickey and Minnie? And with the fucking well, we just do Mouse and, Vader versus Wolverine <laughs> versus Wolverine coming in 2019, and the Red Skull and his army of Nazis can come fucking battle the Goof Troop. Um, you might, I mean, I'll I'd read that. I, I would probably be down <laughs> for it, but I think you know, uh, uh, it, it, I'm not saying that they probably aren't going to do some kind of one-time little event like that. Yeah, you want to put out some sort of stupid Marvel like animated movie with Darth Vader hanging out with Wolverine, fine with me. But, but combining the universes? The minute, the minute Luke Skywalker shows up in one of my comics, I'm just going to be bummed. Yeah, It's that's, not a Star Wars comic. Also, tough. I mean, I haven't read any of them because, I mean, I've just... I do love the Star Wars movies, but I'm just not... I've never delved into, you know, the expanded universe. And I have. <laughs> everybody says that, like, all those comics that are coming out in Dark Horse right now are really great, and... There's all sorts of cool stuff. Then. Uh, the Brian Wood stuff I've read has been tremendous, and I only heard it got better. Well, there's a possibility, a possibility from one story that Brian Wood might have once made a pass at a woman, so don't promote those comics on our podcast, man. But anyways, Rosanna Guinea might I'm sorry, I'll take my chastising. Yeah. Rosanna Guinea might have also been a real dick, and if so, that sucks. But I digress. But another big thing that, is bumming people out is not just the comics being taken away, but also like the co-announcement that basically the whole Marvel expanded universe is pretty much not going to count anymore. That because they're in episodes seven, eight, nine, and they're not consulting, who knows if they'll take pieces of them stuff they like, but they're not going by what happened in the books or in the comics or anything. It's going to be totally new, and that's obviously going to be the true continuity because it's going to be the movies. And then when the Marvel comics take over, they're not going to be expanding upon what Dark Horse did. They're just going to do their own thing. That the whole the whole EU, which apparently George Lucas always promises a thing that like this is definitely going to be continuity, this is not going to change. That it's it's gone. It's been retconned like a motherfucker. It no longer matters. Ouch. A lot of people are gonna be real bummed by that. Oh, I know a couple right off the top of my head. Um, uh, yeah, I know some people that swear by the Heir to the Empire series with yeah. Grand Admiral Admiral Thrawn as the villain who sort of comes in and helps reignite the Empire after Vader's death and everything. And it was very cool. Like, those were really badass fucking books. I, I was a huge Star Wars geek in high school. That was really where I kind of abandoned comics at that point. Um, really, Star Wars was my geek fetish in high school. That was really what I was hardcore into so yeah so that'll be a bummer for those people but yeah it, it sucks for for a, a lot of reasons if they make an official announcement on that the nerd rage on the internet is gonna be great though get your popcorn ready if you just want to go on some message boards and just read some real crazy nerd rage some and, total meltdown the minute they announce that all that stuff doesn't count anymore people are gonna be so fucking mad and we'll see if the fucking the uh you know, if Disney, which apparently can do no wrong, if in a lot of people's eyes all of a sudden out of nowhere is, um, you know, gets a little bit of heat from some of the fanboys. There's this weird thing with Disney where it, they're like, because Avengers, which they had nothing to do with making the most, most of those movies in Marvel, because they've been good, like there's this weird thing where like, which I hope it's good, but where everyone's like, Disney bought it, oh, they're going to be great. Like, they're going to be great movies, blah, blah, blah. Just because their theme park is superior. Yeah. Doesn't mean that other things, like, like no doubt Disney as a company has a track record of great success on lots of things, but not all of these yeah. necessarily are movies. Their own movies, yeah. and during, absolutely. And during, some time, and during some time, just looking at the history of Disney, they, much like Marvel during the 70s, almost went bankrupt. They've had periods of times where they made nothing, no good stuff. It's like the animated movies of the late 80s brought them back into, like, importance. Because they were fucking gashed, losing cash left and right until, you know, they started making their little their little quartet of, like, classic Disney movies where they made, you know, Little Mermaid and Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and all that did so well. 
And also, Disney puts out a bunch of movies. Disney put out... Dude, they put out... So, I, as the, the last, parent of a daughter, they yeah. put out a lot of fucking movies. Yeah, and in the last three years, for, like, big budget movies, they've had at least, like, one that's lost 100 million bucks. So, it's not all just, well, Disney's doing it, so all no, these things are going to be guaranteed to turn to gold. Now they so much of everything. Yeah. It's like... They're almost all, competing against yeah. themselves. Yeah, and there's also the fear of like you know, it's I, I mean you don't I mean they got J J Abrams they've got all the right guys mm-hmm. on these things, um they've got you know Kasdan Lawrence Kasdan who before the podcast Kasdan. we couldn't come up that with was, that was it. helping her out the movies they've got Abrams um so you think they've got all the right guys in place but there is the whole thing of like Star Wars movies as much as people get mad and like I don't want new ones because the last ones suck like they're all gonna make. A fucking shit ton of money so it really honestly it sucks but it really doesn't matter if they're good because they made three movies before that everyone hated each one and each one of them made the same amount of money so if they come out in episode seven as a piece of shit people are still gonna be curious that episode eight can like be good sure the success of the franchise does not at all depend on whether or not yeah. those movies are good and well that's a short bit of news and and you know what you fucking know what i am almost I hate to say it, but it's like, Star Wars is great, it's just magical, but what if it's only great because it was, like, the only thing of its kind, and now, when you compare it to a million movies that meet that same demographic, what is going to be the scenario? Yeah. I mean, that's possible. I mean, it just depends on them recapturing really just, really the characters. That was the problem with the prequels is that the characters just weren't well, well written. And the original, I mean, the original Star Wars is a pretty simple fucking story, the very first one. Now, Lucas already had all the complicated things that were going to happen and had a bunch of things already planned out early on. But if you just go back and look at episode four, the first one, it's a pretty just, dis- I mean, it's simple overall, and a lot of the stuff was cool because you'd never seen it, but the characters are so good. I mean, Han Solo is just one of the best characters ever. And there was just no equivalent of that in the new movies. I mean, they kind of tried to make Liam Neeson's character in the first one kind of that guy that doesn't play by the rules, and he's going to do what he does, Qui-Gon. But then, you know, there's just... And also, once again, it's also a product of the 70s. I mean, you go back... The special effects don't look as good as they obviously did when you were a kid. None of that. But you can go back and watch the original trilogy, and it's still, to me, like great. Like, I can watch it now, and it's still super enjoyable. But another big thing about those movies is because they came out in the 70s, early 80s, is, like, you could have stakes involved. Like, there was a little bit of risk. Like, there were things, like, even in those movies, even though those are fucking movies made for kids that anybody could enjoy... There's definitely, like, darker things that happen in those movies than they would ever approach in a Disney movie now. So that is also one of the fear of, like, you're allowed to get heat. I mean, you know, Han Solo almost died. And they almost convincingly died. And they left him frozen because Harrison Ford, you know, wanted them to kill him. And George Lucas told Harrison Ford, oh, Harrison Ford now later, as everyone expected, was like, I can't sell toys of a dead guy, I'm sorry. Like, it would make better sense for the movie like if we killed you then it would give them like more heat going forward but we can't but still other things happen you know there were still other things that happened in those movies that were still you know like it just felt dark like when they went even as an adult if you go back and watch those movies when they go to um wherever the fuck job of the huts planet is when they're it's in Tatooine yeah in Tatooine yeah. yeah and if they go to Tatooine then you know you feel like shit can happen like when they're in there and meet Han for the first time and they're around like you actually even as an adult like and you see the movie feel like something bad could happen to Luke like somebody comes up to him like he could get like you know shanked or something in here and you're not going to get close to that feeling in these other movies but still you know hopefully they'll still make them good but that was the problem with the prequels too is that like you know there just wasn't that feeling they didn't have the good characters I mean you had Anakin instead of Luke Anakin was just utterly you hated him like, even the old movies, Luke was, like, I mean, he was kind of, like, an angsty teenager, but, like, you understood it. Like, Anakin Luke was... Luke grew within the three movies based on the experience. And Anakin never did. Through. No, he was just, like, well, whatever. I'm and he was far more annoying, even, like, in episode two, when he's supposed to be about the same age Luke was, and his, you know, in episode four, he's far more, like, you're just like, man, like, 
what the fuck? Do you shut the fuck up? Yeah, like, up. You didn't, like, there was no way to root for those movies. That was the problem. And then that's the guy that goes on to become the coolest villain in the history of villains. And yeah. And really... And then if you... If, <laughs> really kind of diminishes yeah. Vader in the process. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I, it's you can still watch the old movies without, like, remembering what happens to them and, like, watch them on their own. But, yeah, if you add up the grand story, like, if you were to say, like, when you watch episode six, if you can't help but think about the prequels and you do think like he doesn't deserve to like get redeemed like he fucking was like annoying and sucked yeah. <laughs> like he doesn't re- deserve this redemption but hopefully they're good and that was our randomly unscheduled rant on something that has nothing to do with our topics as we do every week and it was comic related people, it, was, it was brought up because the Star Wars license got discontinued in Dark Horse so it's so of course we had to talk, so of course we had to talk about how the prequel sucked <laughs> yeah cause fuck those movies yes um, if you listen to the show every week you probably I mean I guess you love that segment <laughs> and the last bit of news Image Expo coming up in a couple of days I guess this weekend and next week I'm sure we'll talk a shit ton about it so Right now, everything's speculation. Always but, an interesting time. Of yeah, but just for us to speculate. I mean, last year, they had all the hidden people, and they're saying they're going to top it this year, which would be tough, because last year, they announced Jason Aaron, Southern Bastards, which... Still has, hasn't come out. No, but they did have the expo in the summer, so it actually hasn't been that long. They went early this year, because they said they just have so many new books to announce, they couldn't wait. You know, which is, I mean, that's good propaganda on their part. We'll see. But, I mean, last year they announced, you know, Jason Aaron and Fractions, two books, and Kelly Sudaconic's book, and that Rucka had a book coming, Brubaker had a second. So it seems like it'll be hard to top, but they're saying they're going to top it. They've got, uh, they have five secret guests that are scheduled to be there that are unannounced that are all supposed to have books coming out next year at Image, and one of them they're saying is somebody that's going to blow your mind, which that's the only one I'm interested in. The other people, I kind of have predictions. I really think Kyle Higgins is going to end up being one of them, because if he's if you follow him on Twitter... He's a creative guy. He's got lots of ideas. And people constantly ask him, does he have anything else coming that's not just DCU related, and he's like, yeah, I've got stuff coming soon, announcements coming soon, so it makes sense that maybe he'll have a book coming to Image. Plus, also, the Expo's in San Francisco, so you think people that live in, like, L.A. are, like, way more likely to be there to, like, announce that they have books coming. So, he's a guy that I think they're going to announce a book for. And then, I mean, anybody else really could be from Marvel or D.C., but, I mean, who else would really be mind-blowing? I mean, I guess if Snyder put out a book that wasn't at Vertigo, that would be, like, a big deal. But that wouldn't be, like, a shock. It seems like if anybody... And Bendis already has indie stuff. It seems like Jeff Johns is like the only Marvel or DC guy that would be like a huge shock that they have a book coming out that's not, you know, at their respective company. Could be. I mean, Bendis hasn't done anything indie in a long time, though. I mean, he even sold powers to Marvel, so yeah. they own it. They put it out under the Icon imprint, which yeah. is their very rarely used yes. creator-owned brand. Yeah, they tried, they tried for a while to create their own, and they just kind of... Much like DC looked like they were going to do, but now Vertigo's got a shit ton of books out. A bunch of them people are saying they're cool, so they've resurged, but much like they did. It's interesting because they were talking about closing down Vertigo for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think now they're, like, different. I mean, I've heard some of the books are good, but I heard, like, the reason, like, she's been kind of quiet, but the Karen Berger, who was the Vertigo person for years, which is one of the reasons they're saying now it's, like, weird because Image is likely to get these other people, like, the other person, I mean, could be Neil Gaiman. I mean, he's talked more about wanting to get more back in the comics. That would be a huge thing if he was going to do an image book. I didn't even think yeah, of him. Yeah, could be. But he could be. But I, I mean, mean, the others like Alan Moore, Frank Miller, like the guys who've just been superstars yeah. who have been away from comics yeah. for so long. That... Also, Karen Berger was saying it's starting up her like own little thing. Like, what if she just started an image imprint, and then all those people loyal to her, Morrison. You know, all those people that, like, gave, she gave their start, like, okay, I'll just put my indie books out through Image now since you're there. That'd be crazy. That'd be a real, that'd be a real thing where DC felt like they had made a mistake, I think, if somebody of that caliber decided to put their books out through, (laughs) through Image instead. That could be tough. <laughs> that is, that's going to be the big excitement. I'm pumped to see who's going to be the giant names they say they're announcing. I just saw the books, because much like every year, it's becoming now a tradition. Every time they have one of their expos, it's like, well, what books am I going to have to cut out of my list, because i got to get some of these books. I mean, last year they announced Lazarus and Velvet and Sex Criminals, and it was like, 
I gotta drop some books to make room. This and they're year, all great. So. so yeah, that's how that goes. That's into the news. I'm getting to the pulls. Not a ton. We actually no. got two weeks worth. Yeah, this was the Christmas and New Year week catch up. Yeah, not that many books came out. I mean, we got most of them, but not yeah. that many came out. Yeah, we, we actually purchased the majority of books that were released. Yeah. By all comic retailers. We guess I'll start out, because I only got to one indie book this week. So that's, I got to Revival, number 16, which is actually from two weeks ago. It's actually one that just got shorted, but they got back in the comic book store. Read it. It's pretty cool. The new happenings are... Um, there's some terrorists in town, and oh, shit. probably who knows who they are. Could possibly be a crazy religious group, which would make sense that they're not happy people are coming back from the dead. Because you know that that would present problems to those folks. Yeah, that present problems because you know if somebody but Jesus could do it, then <laughs> that really destroy that destroys some beliefs. It would either de destroy their entire belief system or make them think they were right about infinite everything. Jesuses. <laughs> <laughs> that could be their thing. It's like we weren't really trying to blow anything up. Actually, we were just setting up for a big celebration of infinite Jesus coming in. But uh, yeah, we got that. That was the only indie, and also just one offering from Marvel. Just one Guardians of the Galaxy number ten. Um, the butt cut edition. The butt cut edition. Actually, a very cool issue. Like, one of my favorites in a while. It was focused on the relationship between Gamora and Angela. And they just kind of have their own version of a ladies night out by beating the shit out of some badoons together. Nice. And, um, you know, you essentially get to learn a little more about each of them's moral compass and what they're all about. And um, I thought it was a great issue that made a lot of a little. It was mostly action. And, and from that perspective, it was just kind of a fluff issue, but the dialogue that they were using in between the action did a lot to further their relationship, so that was very cool, and uh, sort of just a little one-off issue as they are moving forward into this whole Trial of Jean Grey business, which is coming soon. Uh and moving over to some DC comics for this week. We got quite a few of those. Yeah, that, that was the, the majority of my list was comprised of DC. Yeah, we'll start out with, um, I guess I'll start out with Soup Unchained, number five. Only number five. Forget, this book, I guess I get so many comics that you don't notice, but this is definitely more than one time this book has not come out during a month. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is number five, and it's been out for a minute. But then again, Jim Lee, one of the best artists there is. Not the fastest. You find that out with some of these guys. Especially when he's running the fucking half the company. Well, luckily, like, it's just kind of a off-to-the-side story that really isn't, like, the yeah. force behind Superman right now, and it's still awesome, so you can you can afford to wait. Usually. Yeah. It's been awesome. Um, one of the things that bugs people out about the book that I've actually at first did, but now I'm much like, I feel with this book almost the way I felt with The Wake, where I thought The Wake was cool, but then at a certain point, it felt like, you know, I mean, there's only fucking five issues in, but at a certain point, you're like, it seems like they're kind of stalling, but then when the shit hit the fan, you were just like, oh my god. Not as quite of an oh my god moment, but I felt this way in this issue Superman Unchained, like a lot of people's complaints, I and mean, there's so much going on, like, Lois has her own thing going on, Luther has his own story going on, and then Superman has his, we are kind of getting even three, and even Jimmy Olsen, when you're getting three to four stories within, you know, the 20 pages of the book... So it's just a lot going on, but they are definitely starting to intersect, and it's awesome. And this issue, this issue is really good. It's one of my favorites of the series so far. And my favorite part, a lot of it, is just this uh, Wraith character um, showing Clark. You know, he's trying to convince him to just come work with him, work for the government, and he's showing him like a glimpse into the future. He's like, you know, he's like, you're you age way slower than all these people do, you know, and kind of showing him. He's like, you know, he's like, yeah, you could be happy. He's like, then your wife's gonna die, your kids are gonna grow up and die. He's like. And you're still going to be alive, and it's going to suck. So why don't you just come, you know, help me? Which, of course, Superman, he's not going to do it. But it's uh, moved the story along quite a bit, and I thought it was really good. And it was some of the best character stuff that's happened in the series so far. Awesome. Well, um, before we get into the massive stack of Forever Evil tie-ins, yes. I'll also address a couple of the single hero issues. Also, possible to cause as and much as shits his pants <laughs> live on the air folks live and in color get your pull 77 the issue Moody left a skid mark 
That's on possible. my fucking bed, nonetheless. You tell me you don't fart in this bed? You try to tell me you don't fart I in this do. bed? I do. It's for my farts, not <laughs> yours, motherfucker. <laughs> but, uh, so we had two new beginnings at DC. Um, one was, well... It might be temporary, might not, don't know yet. Yeah, they haven't said shit about the Flash. Kind of concerning, because now we're at the issue where the original team has finished up their run and are getting ready to release Detective when they start on it. And Christos Gage and Neil Googe have taken over. Neil Googe, don't get confused with the Mooge. <laughs> He's competing for Ooge sounds against you. Uh, but a little one-off Flash story totally ties into everything that's happened in the previous run. Um, is a great opportunity to expand upon some of the Flash's powers. Man of Paul and Buccioletto showed a couple things that he could do. Christus Gage really took those to new limits in this issue, and that kind of makes me excited that they put him on the book because he's really showed that he can do creative things with the Flash just by this issue alone. The art was amazing. Um, I'd be down for that. Yeah, I like him. It'd be cool if he continues. I mean, he's doing good. He's, you know, does the uh, Justice League part of that uh, Batman Beyond series, so... Awesome. He, he yeah. did some good Marvel stuff a couple of years ago, too. He was um, the uh, Avengers Academy and, and all that stuff. The young... Uh, always focusing on the young guys. Yeah, he's one of those mini guys now, it seems, that, like, just right for everyone. He has a book at, like, every company there is. Yeah, it'd be cool if he takes over the Flash. I mean, that's one of their important characters. One thing they have done a good job of is keeping good writers and artists on their, you know, main big books. So hopefully the Flash stays that way. And important, and a good segue into the next book I'm going to review, it still felt like the same universe they built. Very important for Marvel, or for DC right now, much more so than what Marvel's doing, because this is a complete rebranding, relaunching of their universe. So if you go into the second volume and you have a drastically different book, then you're not doing that universe any favors, you know? And yeah. so Aquaman 26, Paul Pelletier, the artist uh, from the most recent incarnation of the Jeff Johns run yeah, returns. Want to go for Ivan Reese. And Jeff Parker of Batman 66 fame. And you get another awesome issue. Very similar to what Christmas Gage did with The Flash. He shows Aquaman um, not new powers, but just, you know, other things you knew that were his strengths that they didn't really touch on much in the Jeff Johns run. Um, you get to see a lot of trident and in this one, nice. he busts out and cuts a, a monster with the trident. And he does um, an awesome team up with Mira where they do like a combo of powers where uh, he actually, Mira using her water controlling powers, shoots him up into the air and he comes back down and punches this monster in the face and it's just fucking awesome. Awesome. But yeah, it was a really good issue. Yeah, everything Jeff Parker's on of Red is awesome. It does make me go back... And uh, make me want to read. Everybody loves this Hulk run that he had. So oh, awesome. It kind of makes me want to go back and check those books out. Read some good Hulk. Yeah, I, well, if it, the Aquaman is any indication, he knows what the people want. And also, just like The Flash, continues to feel like what Jeff John started, which was a, a revolution for Aquaman in many ways. So let's hope it keeps going. Yeah, nice. Went to some Forever Evil books. No, got a bunch. <laughs> yeah, we got to uh, so we'll start out with the Justice League, number 26. Um, double ship Justice League this month. Didn't even notice. I got that in right under me. I guess they had missed it the month before because, I mean, this is like the correct numbering compared to the other books, but they did come out like a couple weeks apart. But anywho, uh, Justice League 26. Um... They've been doing a good job in these books where they've kind of, each one has uh, targeted one of the crime syndicate and kind of told you their backstory. You got a whole one about uh, Owl Man. You got a whole one about the Ultraman. This one, I guess the rest of the characters you figure you don't need like a whole issue on. We kind of stick them all in here. So that's what you get. You get to see the uh, origins of Power Ring, um, the origins of Johnny Quick and Atomica, and then also a little bit of um, what's going on with just the regular story. It's kind of a glimpse in one of the big things you find out. It's being told from the voice of Grid, who, you know, as we saw, one of the most gruesome things in the New 52 so far was when he separated from Cyborg's body and is now his own thing. You get to find out that he's 
maybe not just simply a pawn for the crime syndicate that, you know, he just made the logical choice that if they help him separate, then once he gets in here, he can kind of do whatever he wants. So once again, a little bit of, you know, problems within their ranks kind of point to my, what end up bringing them down in the end. Um, so it's told for his point of view, he's just going through all of his files and reading up on, you know, or all the files they have there reading up on every single one of the characters. And then at the end, you get to find out Superwoman. He's like, you know, she may be the key to it all. And you also get to see another thing where he's looking through the little facility they've taken over there. And you knew that they had Dick Grace and Nightwing tied up, and that was a big deal. And he talks about him. But then he discovers they have somebody else who's unidentified tied up that they've brought from their world to this world, and you don't know who it is. And that's a big, I guess, teaser for either the next Justice League issue or maybe next month's Forever Evil tie-in. That's going to be a big thing. Could be. I mean, we're getting out of the wire on this Forever Evil stuff uh, right now. Going to the, my next book, Forever Evil Rogues Rebellion. Nice little mini-series, uh, part three of six, giving Brian Buccioletto an opportunity to say an extended farewell to the Flash universe. And uh, did a great job with the Rogues in their run, and they continue it here. I really like this mini-series. It's been a lot of fun. Um, it's really just giving them an opportunity to play in this Forever Evil sandbox that they've created, really. And yeah. uh, the Rogues being the villains with a code, as they've always kind of been, kind of become de facto baby faces here, and it's been cool so far. And right now... This issue, they run into Poison Ivy, who uh, clearly has a plan to manipulate them, and does so. Um, she actually makes them think that they're working together, but of course she betrays them. Uh, some crazy As she does. fucking army of man bats fucking really make things bad for the rogues. And finally, all this chaos happens, and there's a save made by whom? Made by whom? Well, they see the big ice wall, so they can only think their hero, their leader, Captain Cold, is back to help them out. But it's not. It's Mr. Freeze. Not. Oh, yeah, that's right. I am quite more than cold, was his response. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> badass. <laughs> so, uh, very cool. There, that's going, and that's uh, at the halfway point, and then we have jumping over the halfway point. Forever Evil, the main book, issue number four of seven. Lex Luthor and Batman, humanity's last hope. The greatest minds in DC Comics. That's true. And clearly they're leading towards a team up. Now, we don't quite get there, but we're working on it, and that's where the book is pointing us in that direction. Um, like, I don't like you. I don't like you either. I might need your help, though. Out of yes. necessity, Batman brings Catwoman to the Batcave in this issue, because, of course, they're on the run. We found that Batman survived, and uh, he proceeds to show her one of his most embarrassing things in the Batcave, he says, is uh, his plan of taking down each Justice League member, his secret contingency plan. Right. If you're familiar with the uh, Justice League Doom animated movie, then uh, you, you might be familiar with like, the contingency plan, but... Um, He's trying to use that to figure out a way to take yeah. the crime scene again. Yeah, they've they've hinted on that just in the Justice League title before that he kind of had had ideas and files on everyone, you know. Yes, and so um, then we see what the villains are up to, and Captain Cold, Luther, Bizarro, and Black Manta, who are like most of my favorite villains in DC, all together on a team. Uh, we've seen this team accumulate over the last several issues, but now, um, as we've seen the rogues in their little mini-series become the de facto baby faces, Luther and, and company are the de facto baby faces here, and they're trying to take down the crime syndicate, and it's very cool. You see some of the other villains who are working with them. Metallo, um, you see some of the drama that we've has been more deeply delved into in the Justice League tie-ins, but uh, the... The love triangle between Superwoman, Superman, and Batman, or Owlman, rather. And you also find out the identity of Superwoman, and it's not who you think it is. Oh, shit. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, we, we run back into the team of Powering and, uh, what's the fucking Deathstorm. Firestorm's Deathstorm, yes. Evil counterpart. Um, and... The grid, Cyborg's evil counterpart, they're all there. You see that uh, pretty 
pretty much is all building to what the issue advertises. DC is a bad habit of doing on their misleading covers. But yes. Pretty much the whole issue built to Batman and Luther's contingent running into one yeah. another. And before they could fight each other, a contingent led by Power Ring shows up of villains representing the crime syndicate. And, and they uh, turn to each other and go, we may have to fight and, and together. So, so we got that, but as one of his contingencies to Green Lantern, what do you think he had in his in his possession? We do get to see one of the contingencies come into play here. Of course, as a contingency to the Green Lantern, he got a hold of a Sinestro core ring. Nice. He puts it on. Nice. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. <laughs> That's badass. Yeah. And um, there was a little surprise return at the end because that ring was activated. The classic that was previously written out of continuity. So nice. Big issue of Forever Evil setting the plate for uh, what probably going to be one of the major throwdowns in issue number five. Yeah, that sounds cool to me. Yeah, there part you of go. that take it. <laughs> part of that Justice League issue I kind of gloss over was. And they tell the histories of all the characters. I mean, I guess this was always their history, but it was just cool because I never read them. You know how each one of them kind of has the opposite upbringing of their right, yeah. Earth counterpart? So Power Rings is one of my favorites just because he's just a huge pussy. <laughs> and then when he's given the ring, it's like the same thing. Like the He's given the ring by whoever it is, the evil guy that gives him a ring and is like, he's like, I'm going to give this to you because I know you're just going to be a fuck up and you're going to be afraid. And uh, you know, like, then I'm just going to fucking come back and take over because you're going to be too afraid to have it. And Power Ring is just a huge puss. It's awesome. He's afraid all the time. That it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny in small doses, such as this big event, where I'm sure these guys will either disappear or get their own book after this is over with. No, I'm sure they'll disappear. The Crime Syndicate's always been something they trot out every few years as a, as a nice villain to, to combat. And um, every now and then one of them will come back, but I, I'd say, well, once this is over with, we won't see them for a while. Well, that's awesome. Well, good week of pulls. Next week, we'll be back to our regular scheduled plenty of news, plenty of pulls. Got uh, five or six myself next week, including the gigantic, I think it's 110 pages, Detective Comics 27. It cost me eight hard-earned bones. <laughs> it's going to be a big one, but yes. it's, it's uh, the misleading return of Frank Miller to comics. Yeah, he's, there's an alternate cover in there, so whatever. It's some previously unseen art, so... Very cool. It's something. Misleading in the way they yeah, advertise cover, it. Yeah, cover that I'll probably never see a lot of day of, but might not even be the one I choose if they actually have them all there, but we'll see. Um, yeah, but got that coming. Got uh, Action Comics coming, which is exciting. Get the second issue of Greg Pak's Action Comics, which was really good last month. Oh, it was fantastic. We get some Walking Dead, right? We get some All Out War, yes, that's Walking correct. Dead is back this week. Yeah. A Deadpool's we coming out. Deadpool. We got some Captain America. Maybe, maybe Cap. And um, some sort of X Men. Yeah. One of us. Uncanny X Men. Amazing X Men. No, it is Amazing X Men. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Anyways, we'll be back. We'll have plenty of pools. So if you want to copy us and live our lives, then you'll go to the store and you'll get them. Get your pulse.